The school to prison pipeline is a hot topic. A lot of people are talking about young youth individuals, uh, juvenile delinquents that have been lost and caught into the system. In dealing with our troubled youth, would you be able to discuss with us how this pipeline originated, how you feel it kind of originates, how it is sustained, and how it could possibly be broken? Yeah, but yeah, right. I'll try. Um, I think it's interesting that we call it the school to prison pipeline because I think at this point it's more the womb to prison pipeline because our young people are being targeted before they're even That's born. Right. Where we are in 2009 is that the juvenile justice system is basically like a mini jail and many ways more worse than a lot of adult prisons that we have right now. And I can go into a million ways of what we can do to, to you know, break this cycle of the, the womb to prison pipeline but I, and, and how we can reform the juvenile justice system. But I, I think before I even go there, I would talk about what needs to be done in the community. In our community, the reason why it's so easy for us, not us as in people in this room, but us as a society, to send a 15-year-old to prison for life is because we are afraid. And it's not that we're necessarily afraid of our young people, I think. In many cases, we're afraid of ourselves. And the fear cycle is one of the most vicious cycles that they could ever be. We have effectively thrown away not only the future for our young people, but if you really look at it, we've thrown the future away for ourselves. Um, the young people who, right now in New York, New York City, you know, we trial, we trial 16 and 17 year olds as adults for a few different type crimes, but for the most part for things like murder, uh, sex crimes, and, and things of that nature. And what we're doing at ISRA is uh, we're having this initiative where we're, we just launched it. We're launching this initiative called Robbie, which is uh, raise the bar, uh, raise the bar, raise the youth, raise the age. And when we say raise the age, we mean raise the age of criminal liability. And what we're trying to do is actually raise the age of criminal liability to 18. Now, yes, we can raise the age of criminal liability to 18 tomorrow. Would that fix things? Absolutely not. Uh, what, what my job is and what I'm concentrating on is actually raising the bar. And when we say raise the bar, raise the bar of standards in which we will allow our young people to be treated and raise the youth. A lot of our young people, I wouldn't say are headless, but directionless. A lot of our young people don't, ha don't get the resources and the tools and the guidance that is needed in order for them to be, like the brother said in the video, habilitated into society. Forget rehabilitated, but habilitated. Um, you know, the fact that we take so much money out of schools and we push it right into the, you know, prisons and juvenile justice. I mean, you know, we spend about $10,000 a year to educate a young person, but we'll spend over $200,000 per year per kid to keep them locked up. So, I mean, the first step in this cycle uh, of breaking the cycle from the womb to the prison pipeline is actually looking at it as a, as a cycle, as something is going on in our communities. And the only way to do that is if that rumble, it, it can't take just take place in Capitol Hill, that rumble has to take place within the community. We have to become outraged and upset that our young people are being warehoused by the thousands, by a, by a system that cares nothing about them, not given any tools or resources to do anything with their lives. When I was locked up as a kid, I was in, I was locked up at 13, I was in Spofford, and Spofford uh, right now is, is called Bridges, but <clears throat> for those of y'all who are a little bit older in the audience, you would know it as Spofford. And Spofford was one of the most notorious, disgusting places you could ever imagine on planet Earth. I mean, just the smell from that place alone to this day, right now, 2009, you can still smell the, the smell in that place from 1995. And these are the places that we're sending our young people. And it's become okay, it's become almost like whatever, within our community, within our society, because like in the video, we're bombarded with media, oh, black male, 16 years old, committed an offense, so on and so forth. And I'm like, yeah, let's lock him up. But you know what, the real question is, you know, we get posed with a question all the time, so what do you do with the murderers? What do you do with the rapists? Well, let me ask you a question. Let's start from this. What if it was your father who murdered somebody? What if it was your brother who raped somebody? What would be your first question, why? How did that happen? 
And these are the, some of the things we need to start doing is asking why. Let's get to the root of why young people commit crimes and not just lock them up when they commit the crimes. That's great. Um, basically, prison um, industrial complex is not just about prisons. That's why we kind of say industrial complex. It has a lot to do with, I mean, everything. It's the, um, you know, psychiatric institutions. It's um, mental health. It's um, the schools. It's it's the welfare system. It's like all the, um, you know, basically it's everything. everything. It's the big yeah. machine. It's the monster. So we like to say we're not prison and, um, abolitionists. We're PIC abolitionists. Because, yes, we got it. We got it get it all. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the school thing, and, and kids, young kids especially, um, there was a um, speak out that we were doing, an elected official came up and she was for us, you know, against the jails and stuff. And she was saying that basically the third grade test and the fourth grade test that they have going on now, where they have in the public schools, is, you took that test, right? It's the third to the eighth. Thank God she passed, because if she would have failed, she would have gotten left back. And the elected official said, that is how they count the number of jail beds that they're going to determine later on, is how many kids in third grade fail that test. So, um, you know, just some information right there. <laughs> you know, for me, I've been in and out, of, I'm third generation incarcerated. And what that means is that not only have I been in jail, my mother was in jail, and my grandmother was in jail. So as, I'm going to use a, a noun right now. I usually don't like to use noun, but I'm going to use noun. As a woman, third generation incarcerated, that's real. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these stories that we hear is about brothers. Mm -hmm. And the fastest growing population in prison right now is women. women. And it's mothers. You know, so I mean, for me, break, you know, being a prison abolitionist is breaking the cycle of me keep going back to prison. You know, I was a gangbanger. I was selling drugs. You know, now I'm married with two kids. You know, doing what I have to do. And, and it wasn't no program that helped me. It was Prison Moratorium Project, now ISRA, that helped me. And, you know, they didn't threaten me with taking away my freedom. They didn't piss test me every time I came in there. They didn't even look at my rap sheet when I applied for a job, even though I brung all my dispositions, because that's what you have to do. When you, you know, just to prove that you're free and you're able to work now and I don't parole or probation. And they took me in and they showed me a different way of thinking. They gave me voice to my anger. And that's what a lot of our young people need. We need voice to this anger. We're mad. And we have every right to be mad. And now that, you know, I'm a part of this other organization called The Gathering, which is all about, like, kingism and nonviolence, I'm trying to practice what I preach, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, like, being nonviolent. But me being nonviolent doesn't mean I don't have to be confrontational. Confrontation is good, you know, and it's healthy. Sometimes we need to be up in their face in a nonviolent manner, <laughs> but up in their face nonetheless. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the only way that these things are going to happen, that we're going to actually end the cycle, I truly believe the only way that this is going to happen is, is if society as a whole stands up and says no more. That's it, no more. No more of my money, no more of my tax dollars, and you know what? I'm not even going to pay taxes if you're going to use that to build more prisons. How about that, Uncle Sam? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's I mean, you know, That's we got to do something. When, you, when we talk about prisoners, you know, there's a historical context of why things are the way they are right now. When Chino can say he's third generation, when you can be locked down in a cell and somebody say, yo, man, I just seen your father go through the hallway, mm. you know. These are things that happened, and they didn't just happen yesterday. All right? It's been happening, and it's been happening for a long time. And like, he's, like Tino said, you've got to say no more at some point. You know, as the crime rate began to drop in New York, more than in most other cities, the police needed something else to keep them busy. They didn't have the homicides, the robberies, the rapes, the assaults that justified vigorous police activity in the past. So they started a very vigorous program of stopping people on the streets, just walking along, minding their own business, frisking them, searching them, uh, making them lie on the ground, a humiliating experience. And the number of people being arrested for possession of small quantities of marijuana 
uh, rose tremendously. And you're right, there are plenty of whites that have been arrested for this, but in fact, uh, in New York, the great majority of people are being arrested for marijuana charges are black and, and Latino. This does not reflect the composition of who is using. It reflects the racial and ethnic composition of neighborhoods where the police think they can get away with doing this. Now, most of these people are not going to serve major prison time for possessing small quantities of marijuana, but they do have a prior record, a prior conviction on their records, mm. which is going to be taken into account later on when this, at, a, at some future point. The police will justify this by saying this also helps to get weapons off the street and contributes to the reduction of violence. But they've never done the research to prove this. Most of the people who get stopped and searched do not have any drugs and do not have any weapons on them. In the long run, this can only antagonize a community and reduce cooperation that, with the police that might, in fact, help to reduce serious victimizing crime can I ask a question? Yes. What would happen if there was no jails? Would anything change? Mm. She's deep. <laughs> See, she's really, really deep. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. And I heard um, Chino say something which I, I wrote down here, which was uh, voices of the angry. I thought that was really important that you mentioned that. And I think that Deep Dish TV, on, in some regards, is the voice of the angry. Or someone mentioned citizenship. Uh, a voice of those who haven't had an opportunity to use their citizenship. Um, I even wrote down voices for those who are not given a platform to be heard. Uh, and so, you know, when we were looking at these movies or looking at these, these videos, you know, they're not, some, I know it's been mentioned a number of times, and it really not, it's really not about prisons, the themes about prisons but it is so much about our society and the things that we're struggling with and giving people an opportunity to be heard. And uh, I think that we really have to always keep that in mind. And I think that one of the things that we, I think the original question that was asked to me about being a, a media activist is how are we going to use the media to keep our voices to be heard? You know, what are we going to do I mean, I'm hearing all these really important issues that are being thrown out here on the table. But strategically, on a, on a strategic level, how are we going to really move people? Because I think that media is about making connections, making connections with people. You know, I did hear David say initially, um, you know, it's one thing just to put it out there. You know, media is a tool. So, uh, you know, what is that next step? I know that's a question that Deep Dish asks itself all the time. What is that next step? How are we going to use this tool to really make those connections? I, I think I'm going to let that uh, sort of close out the evening. It's about time for us to, to wind down. So Great. could we uh, have a, like a little last round of applause for our moderator and all the panelists? And... Um, and you guys for asking some great questions.